Okay, so this is a continuation of the previous lecture and we were just discussing Hurwitz's theorem which we need. Uh, so let me again uh, just recall what we are trying to show is the following. Uh, if you have a sequence of analytic functions on a domain in the complex plane and suppose you assume that this sequence converges normally to a limit function and you allow this this uh, this exception that the limit function can take values the value infinity then what can happen is either the limit function is completely an analytic function or it is completely the constant function infinity namely the function that takes every point to infinity okay. So, uh, in other words uh, and, and of course here uh, when I say uh, I am including functions uh, that take the value infinity it means that I am not just in taking complex valued functions I am taking functions with values in the extended complex plane which is the complex plane along with the point at infinity okay, uh, denoted by the symbol infinity and of course uh, the convergence whenever the point at infinity is concerned uh, uh, the convergence should be taken with respect to the spherical metric okay, which is a spherical metric on the Riemann sphere transported via the stereographic projection to the extended plane. Okay. And you must also remember that the convergence in the spherical metric is the same as the convergence in the Euclidean metric on the complex plane so far as domains uh, of the complex plane are concerned. Okay. All right. So, uh, in the proof of that uh, that result, we needed Hurwitz's theorem. You see, I, I want you to understand uh, uh, the beauty of that result. The beauty of that result is the following. See when you do a first course in complex analysis and you are not worried about the value infinity okay uh, you are only worried about complex functions then you know that if you take a uniform limit of uh, analytic functions you will get an analytic function and more more generally you would you need not take uniform limit but you can take a locally uniform limit which is for example ensured by taking a normal limit a normal limit is a locally uniform limit okay so uh, even if you take a locally uniform limit or a normal limit of analytic functions, you will get an analytic function. This is what you study in a first course in complex analysis. The proof involves just Cauchy's theorem and Morera's theorem. Okay, but now what we have to do is, you see, we have, we see, our our aim is to prove the great Picard theorem, the little Picard theorems, the Picard theorems, and uh, the problem is that to prove that you will have to worry about infinity as an isolated singularity. Okay. And uh, the, the, the problem is that you will have to worry about uh, meromorphic functions and families of meromorphic functions. You should do topology on the space of meromorphic functions. And uh, the fact is that if you allow the value infinity, a meromorphic function becomes a continuous map into the extended plane. See, if you take an analytic function and suppose it has a pole at a point, okay, then as you approach the pole, the function, the modulus of the function goes to infinity. So, the function goes to infinity. So, the function of course becomes discontinuous in the usual sense, but then if you take allow the function to take the value infinity, you think of infinity as actually a value and where it is a it is the it is the extra point you have added uh, to get the one point compactification of the complex plane, it is that it is a point at infinity in the extended complex plane. Mind you, the extended complex plane is a nice topological space, it is a compact matrix, it is a compact matrix space, it is a complete matrix space. Okay. It is because it is just uh, equivalent uh, topologically isomorphic to the Riemann sphere which has all these properties. Okay. And now the point at, and mind you the point at infinity can be seen on the Riemann sphere as the north pole. Okay. So, it is a you can think of it as a valid point. Okay. And now if you take a meromorphic function and think of it as taking values not just in complex plane but also allow it to take the value infinity then the meromorphic function becomes a continuous function because what you will do is at a pole you will define its value to be infinity and this definition is continuous. Okay. Okay, it is continuous for the topology on the extended complex plane or for example if you want to use the topology in, and that is of course the topology induced by the spherical metric on the extended plane. Okay. So, now you see uh, by allowing infinity to be a value okay, and taking continuous uh, functions with which, allow, which, which can uh, take the value infinity you are also allowing meromorphic functions. Now, you see uh, what you have done is you have jumped from holomorphic functions on a domain to all the way to meromorphic functions on, a, on the domain which means you are allowing even for functions with poles okay? and then you go one more step further and say that you also allow the constant function infinity maybe the function that 
assigns every variable to the value infinity okay it's a constant function infinity and mind you constant functions are continuous in any sense of the term okay so now since you all this has happened now if you again take a normal limit of analytic functions a normal limit of holomorphic functions then you know of course if everything is happening in complex in the complex plane you are only worried at complex values and if this is really a usual convergence okay then you will get the limit function to be analytic there is nothing more but the point is now you are allowing uh, the external complex plane you are allowing the value infinity then why could it not happen that a sequence of uh, analytic functions converges in the limit to a meromorphic function so suddenly a pole some poles can pop up in the limit that can happen right you do not expect it to happen by continuity okay but we have already seen that you can get a function which is identically infinity for example I told you you take the domain which is the exterior of the unit, unit circle and you take the functions z, z squared, z cube etc. So the nth function is z power n now that sequence of functions it is a sequence of analytic functions mind you in fact entire functions that sequence converges uh, if you look at it in the usual sense it will not converge because you take any value z with mod z greater than 1 z power n will diverge because mod z power n will go to infinity because mod z is greater than 1 but if you now in, include infinity as a value and think of the extended complex plane the Riemann sphere in disguise okay then uh, this this z power n will tend to infinity it tends to a point a value in your set and the sequence of functions z power n that converges to the constant function infinity at every point outside the uh, unit circle and lo behold this convergence is even normal this convergence is even uniform on compact subsets with respect to the spherical metric that is an amazing thing so you once you include the value infinity even you get normal convergence okay but the point is that it is converging to the constant function infinity now what is the guarantee that something uh, uh, instead of converging at all points to infinity why cannot it just converge at some points to infinity why cannot it converge on uh, on uh, to infinity only at say an isolated set of points that means you are going to get a meromorphic function okay or why cannot it converge to infinity on some subset which is for example not even isolated why cannot such strange things happen okay so that is the theorem we are trying to prove what the, the, the theorem we are trying to prove is that either what happens is normal what you know expect normally that the limit function is actually uh, a nice complex valued analytic function or the other extreme happens namely that the limit function is always infinity it is a constant function infinity you do not get something in between you do not get the meromorphic functions with poles they will not come in between okay though you so you do not get that that is the uh, so it does not go uh, you know wrong in that sense and that is the theorem we are trying to prove okay see we have to be worried about all these things because we are allowing the value infinity okay once you allow the value infinity anything can happen and then you will have to be very careful and you have to prove things carefully see these are all basically ingredients that you really need uh, to understand very well if you want to understand the Picard theorems the proof of the Picard theorems that is the reason why I am doing this pretty slowly okay so now in order to prove that uh, so how will we prove that what we will do is we will take a sequence of functions on some domain in the complex plane and assume that it, the sequence converges to a function uh, uh, uniformly on compact sets okay that is normally and of course this convergence will be uh, you are allowing the function you are allowing the limit function to take the value infinity so the limit will be in functions with values not in the complex plane but functions with, the, with values in the extended complex plane plus of course the uh, the convergence is going to be normal all right and what you want to show is that suppose the limit function is not the function which is uh, identically infinity you have to show that the limit function is actually analytic okay so it is the limit function is either analytic which means it is a honest complex valued analytic function or it is infinity that is all there are only these two cases there is nothing in between okay that is what we are trying to prove so what we will do is essentially uh, for that you know for proving that we need two facts one fact is the, fa is, the, is, the is the important property that the spherical metric is invariant with respect to inversion 
So, the map z going to 1 over z that defines an automorphism a self isomorphism of the extended complex plane ok it is a homeomorphism in fact it is isomorphism in the topological sense and uh, that when you translate it to the Riemann sphere it simply becomes rotation by 180 degrees around the x about the x axis that is what I told you last time and uh, of course uh, distances on a sphere are not going to change if I rotate the sphere ok that is obvious. So, moral of the story is that this tells you that the spherical metric is invariant under uh, the inversion ok that is that is one fact that we need. The other fact that we need in the proof is Hurwitz's theorem ok which I think some of you must have seen in a first course in complex analysis probably some of you have not seen but anyway I will tell you what it is. See roughly uh, this is what I was trying to tell you at the end of the last lecture and I am, I am now continuing roughly the philosophy of Hurwitz's theorem is the following. Suppose you have a uniform limit of analytic functions and suppose that the limit function is also a honest analytic function ok. Then if you take a 0 of the limit function mind you a 0 of the limit function has to be isolated because the limit function is analytic and you know zeros of an analytic function are isolated and you know this is equivalent to the identity theorem in uh, if you have seen it in a first course in complex analysis. So, the limit you take a 0 of the limit function then Hurwitz's theorem says that you see since you have sequence of functions converging to a limit function then the 0 of the limit function also comes as a cluster point or as a limit point of zeros of functions which converge to that limit function. So, that means that there is a in uh, so you know so you know geometrically what it says is suppose you have a 0 of the limit function at a point z0 then there is a small neighborhood around z0 where that will be the only 0 this is because it is zeros of an analytic function are isolated and the limit function is analytic ok. And then you can choose in this neighborhood sufficiently small so that in that neighborhood all the members of your original sequence which converge to this limit function beyond a certain stage that means for all sufficiently large uh, indices subscripts ok. The functions in your sequence also have, have zeros in that disk ok and the number of zeros is also equal to the order of the 0 of the limit function at that point and these uh, zeros you know these zeros as you make the disk smaller and smaller and smaller these zero the, these zeros actually converge they they converge to the 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 0 of the limit function. So, in other words what it says is that you know if the limit function has a 0 at a point then all your functions in your sequence beyond a certain stage should also have zeros in a neighborhood of that 0 of the limit function ok. So, a, a limit function cannot get a 0 just like that ok. It cannot happen that you know all your limit functions never have any zeros then suddenly you know in the limit suddenly the limit function a 0 pops up out of out of the blue out of nowhere that does not happen ok. So, you see see intuitively this is very nice to believe ok, but the problem with a mathematics a complex analysis or mathematics is that you have all these intuitive things you you believe that such things should not happen uh, by continuity you believe that such nice things should always happen but then to prove them is the is you know that that's that's where the meat lies you have to really sit down and work it out and that's all that's why all this analysis is being done okay so um, the key to who which is theorem is uh, the so called uh, uh, argument principle okay which i'll try to recall so what is this argument principle so uh, 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 the, the the argument principle is as follows. What is this argument principle? So the situation is like this: you are uh, uh, you are in some domain. Uh, so there is a there is a there is a domain here, and well, and inside the domain there is some there is a uh, simple closed contour uh, gamma ok uh, and of course the interior of that contour also lies in the domain ok. Uh, so, both gamma and the interior of gamma ok they lie inside the domain and you have a function f which is meromorphic on the domain. It is meromorphic on the domain means that it is analytic with the exception of an isolated subset where it has poles that is what it means ok you have a meromorphic function. And uh, assume that uh, so you know the function f has uh, uh, is 
uh, only singularity is it, ha it has a poles okay and of course it will have zeros also but you know anyway zeros of an analytic function are isolated you know that so there is some subset of the domain which is disjoint from the subset of poles which where the function has zeros okay now what you do is you make sure that this this contour gamma does not pass through a 0 or a pole. So, you, you assume that f is not equal to 0 on gamma, f has no pole on gamma. Okay. Now, what is the argument principle if you, re, if you recall it? So, the argument principle is if you integrate over gamma, the logarithmic integral of f Okay, which is by definition integral over gamma uh, uh, f dash of z by f of z dz. Okay, because you know a d log is a is a suggestive notation. The derivative of log derivative of log f is is one by f times the derivative of f. So it is f dash by f. So integrating d log means you are integrating f dash by f. All right. So, you calculate this integral of f dash over f, you calculate this integral over gamma. Okay. Mind you, this, this integral is very well defined because you see, notice that the integrand is f dash by f, the only problem is that, uh, for the integrand is where f has zeros because when f has zeros, then f, f is in the denominator. So, f dash by f will have poles. Okay. But I have not allowed any zeros of f to lie on gamma. Mind you, when you integrate something, the variable of integration is varying only on the region of integration. Here, the region of integration is gamma, which is the contour. And on the contour, f is not going to vanish. So, that function I have written down f dash by f, there is going to be no problem with the denominator. And in the numerator, there is going to be no problem because, you see, if a function has a pole at a point, then its derivative will have a pole of order 1 more at the point. Okay? Because if a function has a pole at a point z0, it locally looks like some g of z by z minus z0 power n, where n is the order of the pole at z0. Okay? And if you take this g of z by z minus z0 power n and differentiate it once, you will get a z minus z0 power n plus 1 in the denominator. So that means, you know, if it has a pole at a point, then you its derivative will have a pole of higher order, one higher order at that point. So the only way this integrand can get into trouble because of the numerator is because of the poles of f. But then I have also told you that none of the poles of f should lie on the on on gamma. So the integrand has got nothing, uh, uh, has no problems on gamma. So this integral is well defined. Okay, and the argument principle is that this integral is going to give you two pi i times the number of zeros minus the number of poles inside gamma okay that is the argument principle so this is equal to 2 pi i times number of zeros minus number of poles and here of course n zeros uh, is number of zeros uh, of f inside gamma and n poles is number of poles of f inside gamma okay okay so so what i'm saying here is that uh, when you say number of zeros or number of poles i want you to realize that you have to count them with multiplicity that's very very important so for example if you have a pole you may have only three poles inside gamma, but each pole may have different orders. Okay? Suppose you had three double poles inside gamma, then the number of poles will become six because you have to count a double pole twice, even though it is one and the same point. Okay? Similarly, zeros should be counted with multiplicities. Okay? For example, if you take z power n at zero, the multiplicity is n as a zero. If you take 1 by z power n at the origin, the multiplicity, multiplicity of the pole is n. You should think of it as n poles. The point is geometrically, it looks like only one point, but actually algebraically there are n of them because there are n factors. All right. 
So, when, I, when you write number of zeros minus number of poles, you have to count multiplicities. It is not just the number of points which are zeros minus the number of points which are poles, that is not correct. Okay. Now, well, this is called the argument principle, and you know the point is that if you if your uh, if your functions are if your function is actually analytic, there are going to be no poles. Okay, and what you are going to just get is two pi i times number of zeros. Okay, and why is this called the argument principle? The reason why it's called the argument principle is that if you take this number on the right side and divide it by i, you will get two pi times an integer. Okay, and this two pi time yes, times an integer is you know it's actually an angle. 2 pi n is an angle. So, 2 pi itself is one full rotation. Okay. So, actually this 2 pi times is integer is actually the uh, it is an angle and what is that angle? That is the uh, that is the change in the argument of that is the change in the argument of f okay, uh, as you go around alright. That is the change in the argument that that you get as you go around and um, uh, uh, in fact it is a change in the argument of uh, 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 of f as you go around and the way to see the the way to see it is like this you know uh, if you if you if you naively write log f as uh, ln mod f plus i times argument of f suppose you write it like this okay then you know uh, you can see that uh, 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 if I if I if I put a d to this, then I'll get d log f is d ln f d ln mod f plus i d arg f. This is what I'll get. Okay, and now if I integrate this over gamma, okay, if I integrate this over gamma, what you'll get is so so I'll get integral over gamma d log f is equal to integral over gamma d ln f d ln mod f plus i times integral over gamma d arg f. Now you see the uh, what is this? This this will be zero. See d ln mod f is uh, uh, it will be an exact differential. It will be zero, and uh, basically uh, 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 the uh, it, see it is a it is a derivative of ln of mod f, and ln of mod f is a nice real valued function. Okay. So it is. See, so it is the exact. It is the exact. Uh, it, it, so the first integral is exact, and for you know, for an exact integral, uh, by fundamental theorem of calculus, the integral will be the final value minus the initial value of the antiderivative. The antiderivative for the first integral is ln mod f. So it's ln mod f final value minus ln mod f initial value. But this is a closed loop. So final value will be the same as initial value. Okay. Therefore, it will be 0. The first integral is just 0. And what is the second integral? The second integral dr, dr f is a change in the argument of f. It is a change in the argument of the function f of z as z goes once around gamma. Okay? And that is what this 2 pi i times number of zeros minus number of poles is. Okay? And uh, now you see that you know there is this i here, there is this i here, all right. If you get rid of this i, uh, you now see the uh, reason why it's called the argument principle. It's a, what it actually says is that integral over gamma d arg f is actually two pi times number of zeros minus number of poles. So uh, so it what it actually says is that if you integrate the logarithmic derivative what you are going to get is just the change in the argument of f and what is that change in the argument of f it is 2 pi times an integer and what is that it, so it is a the change in the argument of f is uh, is mind you it is multiples of 2 pi it is a multiple of 2 pi and what is that multiple that multiple is actually number of zeros minus number of poles that is what the argument principle says okay and I uh, one needs this for Hurwitz's theorem and how does one get the proof of Hurwitz's theorem from this it is very simple you just use uniform continuity. Let me go to proof of Hubitz's theorem. I am just giving a short sketch, uh, details can be filled in later. So, here is the proof of Hubitz's theorem. So, what is the situation in Hubitz's theorem? Uh, you are given that Fn converges to F normally. 
f uh, in 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 a domain d this is in a domain d in the complex plane and uh, f n and f are analytic okay and uh, f has a 0 z not in d of uh, uh, multiplicity multiplicity otherwise order n okay this is given and what is Hurwitz theorem? Hurwitz theorem is that all the fn's also will have n zeros okay it they will have n zeros counted with multiplicities in a small neighborhood of z naught and these as n tends to infinity these zeros will come closer and closer and closer and in the limit they will all coalesce to this 0 z naught that is Hurwitz's theorem. So, Hurwitz's theorem says that the 0 of a limit just does not pop up like that it pops up as a limit of zeros of the original functions which gave that limit okay that is what Hurwitz's theorem says. So, so how do what do we do see we uh, we, uh, we we prove this just by uh, uh, by using the argument principle it is pretty easy. So, so you have z naught here all right and then what you do is you choose a sufficiently small uh, 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 you know you choose a sufficiently small disc uh, centered at uh, z naught radius delta okay. So, this is say radius uh, delta uh, mod z minus z naught less than delta is contained in d you take a sufficiently small disc and uh, in fact you also make sure that I uh, will also put uh, mod z minus z naught less than or equal to delta is in d which means that I am also including the boundary the reason is I want compactness by including the boundary I am making it a closed disk closed disk is compact because it is closed and bounded and why do I need that I, because I can now use normal convergence because normal convergence means that whenever you have a compact subset it is uniform convergence. So, inside this subset inside, inside this closed disk and in particular on the boundary of the closed disk which is a nice circle centered at z naught of radius uh, delta mind you that is a that is a compact set that is also closed and bounded. Even on the circle I have uh, uniform convergence because it is a compact subset of T okay that is the reason why I am including the circle and now you see uh, uh, you can of course choose this disk in, in such a way that z naught is the only uh, 0 of f that is because you know f is an analytic function zeros of an analytic function are isolated which means that if you give me a 0 of an analytic function I can find a sufficiently small disk surrounding that 0 where there is no other 0 okay. So, you make that also so, so let me write that z, z naught is the only 0 uh, of uh, f uh, in, in, in the above disk and of course I am not assuming that there is any other 0 even on the boundary of that disk okay mind you right uh, then what is your uh, uh, now what is your uh, now let us write let us write out the uh, the argument principle integral over mod z minus z naught is equal to delta uh, d log f is going to be 2 pi times uh, n this is what I did. Uh, I'll, I'll, I, I think I will get I will also get an I will also get an i okay 2 pi i n this is what I will get okay. If I write the change in argument then I have to remove the i if I am just writing the uh, logarithmic integral then I will get 2 pi i okay. Actually it is 2 pi i times number of zeros minus number of poles mind you the limit function f is analytic so it has no poles okay so it has only zeros and the only 0 it has is at the center which is z naught that is because I have made sure that there are no other zeros nearby I have the zeros of an analytic function are isolated and what is the order of that 0 at z naught it is n okay and th th that is what I have used here okay that is one part of the story. Now look at the, the look at the following thing f n if on the other hand on this side suppose I write integral mod z minus z naught less than delta uh, is equal to delta. Uh, is equal to delta and if I write d log uh, f n suppose I write this what will I get I will get number of zeros minus number of poles of f n times 2 pi i 
uh, where I count zeros and poles of Fn inside the inside that disk, inside that open disk with multiplicity. Okay, that's what I'm going to get. And you know, uh, uh, essentially, uh, what will happen is, you see, th so this is going to be some. Uh, you know, let me use a better notation. Um, okay, so let me put this as capital N sub N small n. Okay, uh, times two pi i. And again, you know, I will not have any poles because you know the Fn's are all anyway analytic functions. There are no poles. Normally, I should write number of zeros minus number of poles times two pi i, but there are no poles here. Okay, so I get two pi i times n n. And now notice this is the big deal. If I take the limit as n tends to infinity of this integral, okay. Now you see this is the point. Fn converges to F normally on T, and the set on which I am doing uh, that I am worried about is the set where I am doing this integral. It is this circle, because you see I am worried about this integrand. The integrand, uh, the variable of integration varies over the, re the the region of integration. The region of integration is the circle. So I am worried about this circle, but this circle is compact. It's a compact subset of D, and on this circle, therefore, there is uniform convergence. Now you know because of uniform convergence, I can interchange limit and integral. Okay. Now this is uh, one of the important properties of uniform convergence. Uniform convergence allows you to do things like changing limit and uh, substitution, which is continuity, and then limit and differentiation, which is uh, differentiability term by term. And it, it also allows you to change limit and integration, which allows, which is the same as saying that you can integrate term by term. Okay. So because of uniform convergence, I can push the limit inside. Okay, and when I push the limit inside, what will I get? I'll get the thing on the right. I'll get simply integral mod z minus z naught is equal to delta uh, 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 limit n tends to infinity d log f n, and that is equal to actually this limit n tends to infinity d log f n is just uh, d log f. Okay, so. So what I get is look at look at the model of the story. The model of the story is, is that limit as n uh, as small n tends to infinity. Uh, limit as small n tends to infinity. Capital N sub small n is capital N. This is what I get finally. This is just by applying uh, uh, argument principle. But you see, uh, what does it say? Capital N sub small n is a sequence of integers, okay, and a sequence of integers is tending to a constant means that the sequence becomes constant beyond a certain stage, okay. See, what does this mean? This means that for for n sufficiently large, n n is the same as capital N sub small n is the same as capital N, okay. See, sequence means it should come closer and closer, but when these are integers, the closer means either uh, closer means that they are the same, literally. Okay, if you say one integer is within an epsilon of another integer, they have to be the same. Okay, if epsilon is less than one, all right. So, n n is equal to n for n sufficiently large. What does that mean? It means this f n s. They have what is this n capital n sub small n? It is the number of zeros of f n inside that disk. And what is what? What have you got? You have gotten that beyond a certain stage, all the f n s. Have exactly n zeros, and these n zeros, uh, and that n is the same as the number of zeros of is the same as the multiplicity of the zero of the limit function f at z naught. That's what it says. And now, mind you, whatever I have done here will work if I make delta smaller. After all, if I make delta smaller, the right side is not going to change because I I am always going to get only the order of the zero. Of f at z naught, so therefore this whole argument will work if I make delta smaller and smaller and smaller and smaller. So that means what? Uh, all these zeros of f n's beyond a certain stage, you see, they are all, uh, you know, uh, they're going to go and cluster. They're going to go closer and closer and closer. And they're going to cluster and they are going to finally coalesce into the zero at z naught, and that's how it is theorem. So it says that uh, the zero of uh, Limit normal limit of analytic functions. 
that 0 does not just pop up just like that, it comes from zeros of the original sequence of functions beyond a certain stage, okay. That is the that is what we just said. Okay, so now we will have to use this to uh, give the proof of uh, the fact that if a sequence of analytic functions uh, does not converge to a, uh, an analytic function, then it has to completely converge to infinity, the constant function infinity. So now let us go ahead with, uh, let us go ahead with uh, trying to prove whatever we are trying to prove. So, uh, uh, so proof of, uh, so, so, we, so we go back to the old uh, uh, the whole problem that we were worried about, the statement that we first gave. Uh, so let uh, fn be a sequence of analytic functions on D, which is uh, in, in the complex plane, it is a domain. Uh, so fn is in, uh, in our notation, it is in H of D h of d stands for the analytic functions or holomorphic functions on d and mind you this h of d is contained in m of d, uh, m of d is a set of meromorphic functions on d and that is further contained in uh, uh, the, uh, the set of all continuous functions from d to c union infinity, okay. And mind you when I uh, and mind you uh, here when I am writing it like this. I am treating the meromorphic functions also as functions which can take the value infinity and the meromorphic function the value at a pole is defined to be infinity mind you, okay. And the sequence fn is in here and you assume that fn converges to an f point wise, okay. So fn converges to f normally with respect to the spherical metric. Okay. Mind you, I have to allow the spherical metric because I have the point at infinity also as a value, all right. And mind you, this is sitting inside the set of all maps, uh, not necessarily continuous from D to C union infinity, okay. And this script C is continuous maps, this is this is continuous maps, all right. And the mind you, let me again, uh, let me again insist, this is convergence with respect to the spherical metric. Okay, pointwise convergence with respect to the spherical metric. Why I need the spherical metric is because the limit function at one at some point can be infinity. Then I will have to measure distance with respect to infinity, and I can do that only with the spherical metric. Okay, now I already proved a lemma last time. It's something that you already know that whenever you have a normal limit of continuous functions, it's continuous. So uh, that's quite clear because a normal limit is a locally uniform limit, and therefore. Uh, and you know a, a uniform limit of continuous functions is continuous and a function which is locally continuous is also continuous because continuity is a local property. So uh, f, this f, this limit function f is certainly continuous, okay, f is continuous. So f is actually here, f is a continuous map from D to C union infinity and what is it and what is the claim? This is the big theorem that we are trying to prove. The claim is if f is not analytic, then f is identically infinity, that is our theorem. That is what we are trying to prove, okay. So we, we, uh, we uh, have to show that if f is uh, uh, not uh, analytic uh, or, le or let me write it the more, more uh, logical way, if f is not identically infinity, then it is analytic. This is what we have to show, okay. So this, so let me point out, you do not have a situation where, so the limit function either f either lies, uh, it is either the function function here which is the constant function infinity or it is here itself, it is in H of D itself. It cannot go into this, it cannot become meromorphic, that is it cannot become honestly meromorphic, okay. So you know it is like saying that what is the meaning of saying it cannot be honestly meromorphic? It means that suddenly a pole cannot pop up, okay, in the limit. You have a sequence of analytic functions, it is converging to a limit function. A pole simply cannot pop up out of the blue. Of course, the original sequence does not have poles because they are analytic functions, okay. By continuity, you should expect this also to happen. But again, you know, this is the point, this is this has to be proved, and you can see it is like 
it is there is already the flavor of Hurwitz's theorem which says that you know when you have a limit of analytic functions uh, 0 of the limit just does not come does not pop does not just pop out of the blue it comes from a limit of 0 to the original functions. So that is what we are trying to prove. So assume that f is not identically infinity then show that f is analytic okay and what does what does it mean it means that if f does not is not going to be the identically the function infinity it cannot assume infinity even at a single point mind you it has to assume only fine only complex values at every point that is the strong thing there if it assumes a value infinity at a point and if that point is isolated point where it is assuming the value infinity it means it is a pole okay but that does not happen that is what it is all right that is that is what we have to prove. So, so how, how does one see that well uh, you see uh, you, you, you let uh, you take this subset d sub uh, d infinity okay uh, this is the set of all z in the domain where f of z is infinity okay and this is a proper subset of the of your uh, domain it is a proper subset of the domain because you have assumed that f is not identically infinity. If f is identically infinity then d infinity that is the same as saying d infinity is d okay but when you say f is not identically infinity it means that the limit function f has some point where it has some finite complex value a value which is different from infinity in the extended complex plane okay. Now mind you this is a closed set actually okay because uh, it is the inverse image of infinity under f which is a continuous map I already told you that f is continuous and infinity is a single point is always closed okay in the one point compactification. So if you take the inverse image of infinity that will be d infinity so d infinity is just d infinity is just f inverse infinity and that is a that is closed inside d it is a closed subset just by continuity of f all right. So I will stop here.